Welcome to this Wise Owl tutorial on the various date functions within the DAX expression language within Power Pivot. Here's what you'll learn during the tutorial. We'll have a look at creating a data model to begin with, and then look at various DAX date functions, total YTD, same period last year, date add, and parallel period. We'll have a look at error checking using the if error function, and then have a look at semi-additive calculated fields, which partially aggregate, aggregate data. Finally, we'll have a look at the dates between function to return a specific range of dates. So let's get started. For this tutorial, we're going to use the same data model as for the previous tutorial in this series on calendars and dates. Before we begin looking at date functions, I wanted to show one little trick you can do with the year column. If I create a pivot table based on this data model, and if I then choose to tick the year column to display it in my pivot table, Excel will do what it always does with integer columns and assume I want to sum it, which is not the right thing to do. I can get around this by going back to my data model and in either diagram view or data view, I can select the year column and change its data type from whole number to text. If I then go back into Excel and click on the year column again, because it's now a text field, it will assume I want to uh, aggregate by it. I won't have the same problem with the month name because that's automatically a text column. And what I'll do for this example is add in the evergreen species column across the top and then choose to sum the quantity. And the last thing I need to do is go back and sort out my dates. And to do that, I can choose to sort them into alphabetical order, which as we discovered previously, does the exact opposite of what it says on the menu item. The best way to learn date functions in Power Pivot is just to try a few of the most common. And that's what we're going to do in the rest of this tutorial, beginning with total year to date. You'd expect this to give, for example, for amphibians 53 for January, but then 101 for February because it's accumulating the numbers, and then 163 for March, etc. To get this to work, we need to create a new calculated field. I'm going to put it in the transactions table, and I'm going to call it YTD for year to date. The function we want to use on this occasion is total year to date. You can see if I pause there that there's also month to date and quarter to date as well. It takes up to three arguments, rather four arguments. The first two are compulsory. The first one is the expression. What I'm going to do is take the sum of quantity, the implicit field already created for me. And the dates I'm going to use are going to be the calendar dates. This is the main point of using a calendar table. It allows me to automatically pick up and date columns and use them in uh, date functions and get them to work. If I then close the brackets, I can format this. It's going to be a whole number with a thousand separator. Check my formula, it's okay. And when I choose okay, it will give me the correct figures previewed. That's not quite the end of the story for total year to date, because what happens if your financial year, for example, ends on the 31st of March? You want the figures to then pick up from uh, the base figure zero at April. You can do this by adding another argument to the year to date function. If I just get rid of the ending bracket and put a comma in, you can see that the third argument should be the filter. But Power Pivot is intelligent enough to realize that even if I don't add a comma in as a placeholder for that, if I try, just type 03-31, it will automatically recognize that to be the fourth argument and automatically restart my year to date on the 1st of April for each year. If I then choose OK, what you should see is that it's doing exactly what I wanted. It's ending on March and then resuming at zero in April. And you can see that pattern is repeated not only for every single year, but also, of course, for every single species and anything else I add to the pivot table, indeed, for whatever the current query context is. What I'm going to show now is how to use the impossibly useful same period at last year function to show for any quarter, month, year, date, whatever, what the equivalent sales would have been in the previous calendar year for the same period. I'll just get rid of the YTD because it's cluttering things up a bit and then create my new calculated field. I'll put it in the transactions table and what I'm going to do is call it last year. As often is the case, I'm going to calculate something and the thing I'm going to calculate is the total quantity. So I'll, just for a change, I'll sum the quantity field directly. And what I can now do is add a filter. 
By default, this will automatically refer to the date in the current calendar. What I'm going to do is put the same period last year function instead to refer to the dates in the calendar for the same period, but in the previous calendar year. And that's all I need to do. It will automatically work. At this point, you begin to fall in love with Power Pivot. If I then choose OK, what you should see is for every single possibility, it's showing the same period in the previous year. I'll just give two examples. That figure 746 for the total for 2014 is what the equivalent figure was in the previous 2013 year. And to give one more example, let's choose this 196 for birds for March. That's the equivalent figure to 196 in the same month in the previous calendar year. So it's worked. The next thing we're going to do is to show for any period what the sales were two quarters ago. You'll probably expect me to say something like we could use the same period two quarters ago function, but there's a limit to how useful Power Pivot can be, and instead we'll use the more general date add function. Before we do anything, let's just get rid of the last year calculated field, and now we'll create a new one, and we'll put it as ever, as ever in the transactions table, which I've just completely missed, and we'll call it two quarters ago. And what it will do is calculate something. The thing it will calculate is the total quantity. And the filter it will apply to it is going to use the dates, but from two quarters previously. To do that, you can use the, the date add function. You can specify the dates which are your base point, if you like, which are the calendar dates. And you can say how far forward in time you want to go. And the answer to that is minus two quarters. So I'm going back in time instead. As to the interval I type in, you can type in certain words like month, day, year, quarter. I'm going to choose quarter. It doesn't go in inverted commas, which is a bit disconcerting. And then I can close my brackets. And when I format this and choose OK, what you should see is it gives me the same sa the sales for the same period but two quarters ago. Just to give one example there, 53 is the same figure as it was six months or two quarters ago. Continuing our tour of useful date functions in Power Pivot, what we're going to do now is repeat the same uh, procedure to show the total sales from two quarters ago. There will be a subtle difference though. The previous example used date add. What we're now going to do is use the parallel period function. What I'm going to do is just get rid of the total quantity from my pivot table. And so what I'm going to do is create a calculated field which should give me exactly the same results as this one. Let's see if it does. So I'll add my new calculated field. I'll put it in the transactions table. Um, what I'm going to do is call it two quarters ago, which I conveniently had in my clipboard. And what I'm going to do is calculate something, the sum of the quantity, and then the uh, range of dates I'm going to sum across is going to use the parallel period function. You can see I've lost my auto-completion, but backspacing brought it back again. Over the calendar dates, going backwards two periods in time. So I'm going to use the same trick. I'm going to go minus two, and then my period is going to be quarter. I don't think it's case sensitive. I'm about to discover. So if I then format that and choose OK, you can see it actually gives me different figures. And the reason for that is what it's doing is summing the whole of the quarter. So for example, for July, August, September, the figures are 53, 48, and 62. The total sum of that is 163. And that's why for the figure two quarters ago, it's given me the figure for the entire quarter rather than an individual month within it. That's just the way the parallel period works. If I'm going to get it to work the way I wanted it to, to give exactly the same results, I'm going to have to change the level of granularity and make it more precise. So what I can do is go into my function, and rather than going two quarters back, what I'm going to do instead is to go six months back. It's a bit confusing when you type in month. It's actually showing the month function there, whereas I want the word month as a time period, but they'll give exactly the same results. If I then choose OK, you can see it's actually giving me the same period from six months ago, which is the same as the date ad gave me. What I'm going to do now is to calculate the total year-to-date sales for a year divided by the whole of the sales for the whole of the previous year. To give you an example of what this will look like, for February, cumulative year-to-date sales are 67 plus 54, which is 121. The figure for the whole of the previous year is 746. 121 divided by 76 is 16.22%. 
So that's the figure I would expect to see for February, and it should gradually accumulate until, if things go well in 2014, it should be above 100% because I've exceeded the previous year's sales. Now I've had a bit of a blitz of my calculated fields in the transactions table, and as you can see, I've got rid of them all. So we're going to have to create the numerator and the denominator, the thing I'm dividing and the thing I'm dividing by, from, from afresh. But there's no harm in doing that. The first thing I'm going to do is get the year to date. And the year to date will use the total YTD function as we did before to calculate the total quantity for the calendar dates. And when I format that as a whole number and choose OK to display it, you can see it's correctly giving me the cumulative year to date for February, which is 121. What I now need to do is calculate the previous year's figure, which I'll call previous year. And what this will do is give me, or rather calculate, the total quantity using the parallel period function based on the calendar dates, going back one period in time, to be more specific, going back one year. Now we've already seen that the parallel period function I'm using here sums the whole of the previous period. So that's exactly what I want to pick up on the whole of the previous year's sales. When I choose OK, what it should do is give me the same figure for every single month, because regardless of which month I'm looking at in 2014, the whole of the previous year's sales was 746. What I now need to do is divide one of the two calculator fields I've created by the other. And I'm going to call this one ratio which I'll attempt to type in the correct case. And what it will do is take one figure divided by the other. So the first one is the total year to date, which I called year to date. And the second one is going to be the previous year, which I called previous year. There's no aggregation involved because both of these two calculator fields have already done that aggregation for the query context. So that I can leave that just like that. I'll format it as a percentage. Check my formula, it's okay. And things will nearly work perfectly. I mean, the good news is it's giving exactly the correct figure for 2014 for February, 16.22%. The bad news is because in 2013, it's trying to refer to the whole of the previous year's sales and divide by that. And because there aren't any previous year's sales, we get a divide by zero error. Now the neatest way I can think of to get around this is to introduce some error trapping. So what I'm going to do is go back to my ratio field and I'm going to proceed it with the if error function. And this has an equivalent in Excel, which has the same name. What it does is calculate an expression and then says what you're going to display if there's an error in the function. In this case, I'm going to display a blank rather than a zero. I think zero would be quite misleading in this context, so I can use the blank function to display nothing. If I then choose OK, what you'll see is it gives the correct results for 2014 and just leaves 2013 pleasantly blank. What I want to do now is to show semi-additive measures, or as they now should be called semi-additive calculated fields, a wonderful term for something which is basically summing, but not absolutely everything in the query context. What we're going to do as an, ex as an example is to show total sales in three different columns next to the quantity. The first will give the sales on the first day of each calendar period, in this case each month. Then we'll have the sales on the last day of the calendar period. And then we'll have the sales on all the other days. So the sum of these three columns will sum in January's case to 733. You'll notice I've deleted any old calculated fields we might have had, and what I've also done is tidied things up by removing the species. So let's have a go at doing this. Uh, firstly, we'll create a calculated field which gives the total sales on the first day of each month. So what I'll do is I'll call that first day. And what the formula will do, as ever, is to calculate something. It's calculating the total quantity, as ever. And the expression for which dates we want to use will restrict the calendar dates to just the first day. So we're going to use the first date function based on the calendar dates. And if I check my formula, it works. And I can format it to display it as a whole number.
When I choose OK, it should give me a fairly small number because there weren't many sales on the first day of each month. I can now repeat that to create uh, a calculated field giving sales on the last day of the month, which I'll call last day. So this will do a very similar thing. It will calculate, it will calculate the total quantity, but in this case, it's doing it on the last date of the month. And I hope I've got all my syntax right there. I'll find out in a second when I choose OK. And what that does is give me the sales on the last day of the month. Just to prove this is actually working, let's look at that figure 23 for January 2013. If I go into my transactions table in the Power Pivot data model, I've created a formula which will look up the POS date field from the point of sale table. And then I've sorted it, just to show there's no trickery here, into ascending order. Now if I scroll down this, what I'm going to do is find the 31st day of January, the last day of the month. And what you'll see is if I um, select all the sales on the 31st of January, there they all are, and if I copy them to the clipboard, then if I go back into Excel and create a new sheet and paste in those figures, you would expect their sum to be 23, and indeed it is, which is the same as the figure giving, given. So that's all working. The only other thing to be able to say about semi-additive measures, or the only other mainly important thing, is that what would happen if I didn't have any sales on the 31st of January? The answer is I'd either get zero or blank in my answer. And so what you could do, and I'm not going to cover this in any more detail, is you could change your functions. So instead of using the first date function, used, I'll see if I can bring it up in the list here, I'll probably have to go back there. You could use the first non-blank function. And what that will do is take the total sales on the first date it finds which where the sum isn't blank. And there's a similar function called last non-blank as well to do the same thing at the end of the calendar month. In the previous part of this tutorial, I promised I would create a third column giving the total sales between the first day and the last day. And that the sum of these three figures would equal the total for the entire period. To do this, we need to create a new expression, and I'm going to put it in the transactions table and call it monster. And the reason I'm calling it monster is because it's a bit of a monster, monster of a formula. And it will prove that the expression editor is quite hard to use. I challenge you to type this incorrectly the first time. So what I'm going to do is calculate the total quantity. So far, so good. And what I now need to do is put a filter on that to say, instead of summing it across all the available dates, I'll just choose the dates between the first and the last day. So I'm going to use the dates between function. The dates I'm using, obviously, are the calendar dates. The first day of my period is this. I'm going to use the date add function to take the first date for the calendar period. I hope you're still following me. And add one day onto that. And that will give me my first date in my range. And for the last date, I'm going to do a very similar thing and take the last date and take one day away from that. So I'm going to take the date add function based on the last date for the calendar dates. From that, I'm going to subtract one day. As to how many closed brackets I need, um, I need one to go with the date add function, and I'm actually going to do this as I usually do by guesswork, I'll confess. And let's see if I got it right. I did. And if I choose OK, it will give me the correct figure, I hope. It's not actually showing up for some reason, so what I'll do is tick it, and it will show it in the pivot table. And just to take a random period of February, the sum of those three figures is indeed 699. So the sum of the first and the last day and all the days in between is 699. The dates between function is useful, amongst other things, in creating moving averages. There's no moving average function within Power Pivot, but you can mimic it using dates between. But that's beyond the scope, I'm afraid, of this tutorial, and I'd recommend you to Mr. Google for that. If you like what you've seen and heard so far, why not head over to the WiseR website, where you can find loads more free resources, including these videos, some written blogs and tutorials, and even some exercises that you can download to practice your skills. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.